All right, I think we're going. Welcome back, everybody, to Crusade Against Ignorance. Today we have a really special discussion between two professional philosophers, both of whom who have been on the channel before, but independently, and are now coming on together so we can get them talking to each other directly. Uh, Dr. Josh Rasmussen, who's been on before to talk about his book, and Dr. Graham Oppie, who was on recently with me to talk about uh, defending naturalism. And then again, returning um, my partner in crime philosophically, Joe Schmidt, who's been on quite a few times to help sort through some stuff, a recent video on existential inertia. So um, today we're going to be talking uh, about on the nature of ultimate reality, what it is, how to define it, where we agree, and uh, where we don't. Or maybe we all agree and we're all naturalists or we're all theists. Hopefully we'll, we'll figure it out by the end. So um, without further ado, Joe, we'll go to you. And uh, if you want to start off with that first point, yeah, definitely. So um, one thing that's really good for discussions like this is to start off with a, a general framework that we all share, a uh, general methodology or general framework. Um, and so I, I think uh, it'd be really good to start with both uh, Josh and Graham talking about uh, their shared methods of inquiry, their shared uh, tools for probing worldviews um, and probing hypotheses, you know, like explanatory power, breadth, depth, things like that. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys so you guys can talk about uh, the tools and methods of inquiry. Cool. All right. Well, let me just first say thank you guys for having us on. I mean, I love Graham and it's great to be able to have a conversation with him like this without having to wait to see him at a conference or something, you know, <laughs> so this is really cool. And I anticipate that we're going to be able to be pretty productive in at least clarifying some of the things at stake. And one of the reasons I anticipate that is because I've noticed from our previous conversation as well as from reading Graham's work, that it seems like we have some interesting overlaps in terms of what our values are, um, even our styles of inquiry. And just to kind of mention a few tools for inquiry, um, we value simplicity. So we're looking for the sort of simplest theory that would explain the data. Of course, isn't, this isn't the only thing. Um, we've talked about uh, looking for a theory that has explanatory power, uh, predictive success, and, uh, and, and something I, I wanted to add here that Graham's actually helped me to think more about in terms of the value of spelling out an inquiry more scientifically than just through arguments. I think as philosophers, we tend to put things in the form of argument. Um, but I also find it helpful to think in terms of a hypothesis, predictions, uh, and seeing if it has predictive success. And so those are some of the tools and those are the, some of the things I think I think we... We, I mean, it's not like it's 100% alignment. I mean, there are questions about how to define simplicity. And so we can explore these things together. But um, I think there's some serious overlap there, which makes it actually quite interesting when there's significant ontological differences or salient ones. Um, but then I anticipate that maybe we can make some progress on ontology having common tools in hand. OK, so that all sounded pretty good to me. Um, I think that uh, lots of discussions kind of get off on the wrong track because people want to jump to the arguing bit without, first of all, doing the understanding what the positions mm -hmm. are bit, which is quite hard, uh, but very important. So mm -hmm. I like to think of people as having theories, sort of global theories of everything what other people might call worldviews. Uh, and then what's sort of interesting is to think about the advantages and disadvantages of the different worldviews that people have. And if you're going to try to argue for the advantages of your own worldview, you better have a pretty good idea about what's in the competing worldviews and what, they're, what the attractions of those other worldviews are. That's important about the kind of fundamental method. And I agree about the, the importance of trying to minimise your theoretical commitments, of simplicity, the importance of trying to have explanations for as much as possible. Uh, and although it probably won't come up so much, and I agree about predictive success as well, but I think of that as a value that's much more important for science than it is for other areas of inquiry because it's so much harder to get predictions in other areas um, where the predictions are about sort of future data that you can get out of doing experiments or making observations of certain mm -hmm. kinds. Yeah. 
it's interesting just to chime in a bit here. Maybe we'll later talk about potential predictions from different theories, but I wrote down five potential potential predictions from a certain theory of the foundation of things, if there is such a foundation. Perhaps later we'll get to that. Um, but I certainly agree that in philosophy, it's sometimes harder to get those predictions worked out in a way that's empirically testable, since some of the data that we have isn't so much data through the five senses, but data through the sense of reason or sometimes introspection, or maybe it's moral data. Um, and so that adds complexity to that. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, perhaps, perhaps emphasize the importance of um, getting the theories out on the table and the hypotheses and worldviews out on the table. It would be best to um, sort of give a brief sketch, perhaps, uh, of Josh or worldview or, or the, you know, the apparatus you bring here, or and, and Graham to do the same with his sort of naturalism, theism, and so on. That'll be a good springboard into the defining part. So well, I, yeah. I, I, I'm smiling because I was thinking about my worldview. And I was thinking, okay, do I just list all the things I think exist? Like, so my <laughs> wife exists, you know, she's part of my worldview. You know, maybe we're looking for the most fundamental things. Um, but then I don't know if I can define my wife in terms of other more <laughs> fundamental things. So I get sort of stuck with things like that. Um, before going into there, I, I also wanted to add something about sort of the character of these kind of conversations, because I think sometimes, in a, especially in sort of a popular sphere, a popular contest, it takes the form of a debate where even if you're trying to clarify, it's like you're trying to clarify to prepare the way for a kind of dialectical battle. I know, Joe, you're smiling because you know this is sort of a theme that I have. Right? I, can, I can see that in your eyes. But, um, but it is a theme because I think what's not seen in the popular sphere is what goes on kind of behind the scenes uh, between academics and philosophers. And, and something I kind of wanted to note is the sort of value that Graham has brought to other philosophers in the field, kind of behind the scenes through helping to clarify things, exposing um, problems and, and obstacles to things. And the nature of these conversations feel to me not competitive. They feel like we're taking our lights together and we're really trying to expose clarity. And that's fundamentally my goal in this conversation is like, I just, I want to get clear on some things. <laughs> That's really what I, wa I want to accomplish. Um, so I think that's kind of helpful to sort of frame how I'm thinking of it. There are a bunch of difficulties about the kind of idea of setting out your worldview. I don't know how much we want to go into this, <laughs> right? Because you can think of a, a worldview as a set of sentences, right? And the important thing about it is that it will be closed under logical consequence. So you'll be committed to all the things that are logical consequences of the things that you actually believe. Um, even though you don't believe those other things because you've lots of them because you haven't, maybe you, you've never thought about them or you don't even have the capacity to think about them. I mean, ability to work out logical consequences is limited, um, but nonetheless, we're committed to them. So if it turns out, for example, that your worldview commits you to kind of um, absurd things, right? It won't help you when this is brought to you to, to your attention to say, "Oh, but I don't believe the absurd things." Right? Mm -hmm. The fact that they, the fact that the consequences are there is bad news for you. Um, so, what are you supposed to do? Because this worldview is enormous. I mean, as Josh just pointed out, and there's a lots and lots of stuff that you believe. Uh, you might hope, maybe that you could kind of compress this because if you've got a theory, you could axiomatize it. But actually, even if you could do that, I don't think that would be very helpful because I suspect that you can't read off your commitments from the axiomatization. Um, so, uh, I mean, but that's, that's going to be one question. Another question is going to be about what you can explicitly define. So this was something else that Josh alluded to. Um, I think of your commit, I say something like your commitment to cats is just primitive because I don't think you can define what a cat is, mm. right? And so it turns out that your worldview will have lots and lots of primitive commitments in it. Those commitments, are, so is is what's primitive there just the point about definition, or is there, or does it kind of follow from the way that you can't? give a definition of certain terms that your commitment to those things is primitive. Even though, for example, there's lots of things you can explain about cats. You can explain why cats exist because mm -hmm. in, 
in various ways. One way is by saying um, evolution, right? There was a time when there weren't any cats and then there are cats and we understand roughly how it came to be that there are cats. Um, things about the particular cat that you've got won't be just explained by that because there's domestication, which is a very long process as well. And whether you've got your cat's long head or short head maybe has more to do with domestication than it does to do with evolution. Okay, but then there are other questions about cats. Why is it a cat? Well, there's a kind of particular arrangement. I'm just going to call it cat stuff because that will that will do, right? There's a bunch <laughs> of stuff here that's organised into the cat, right? And that's another kind of explanation of why you've got a cat. None of that, I mean, there, and there are different kinds of, there's, there's further things that you might see. It seems to me that none of those are going to undermine the idea that there's a sense in which your commitment to the cat is primitive, even though there's a bunch of things that you can explain in different ways about why you've got this cat here and now. Okay, so there's just something to think about. I mean, this yeah. is something I haven't got. I haven't got the... I, there's lots of things about this that I haven't got fully worked out, and that's one part of it, thinking about that kind of stuff. I wonder, could it help, Graham, if... Um, uh, would you sort of think that the primitives in the explanatorily most fundamental part of your theory, uh, those are maybe more relevant in the sense that... So you can explain the cat in terms of more fundamental things, and then sort of your theory has a certain kind of advantage, at least with respect to simplicity, if it's most fundamental, uh, if, if the terms in the most fundamental explanation are reduced, something like that? So, well, it depends which one of these kinds of explanations we're going to go for. So if, it's, if we're looking at a kind of causal historical explanation and your causal historical explanation terminates ultimately in something that's necessary, mm -hmm. then uh, it's hard to see how you can do better than that in terms of the explanation, unless there are details in the explanation that are going to come out differently. But I don't think that we're going to disagree about the evolution of cats or the domestication of cats and so on. We might be a bit unclear about right back near the beginning of causal history, exactly. Mm -hmm. we, we, we may disagree about how, what things are like back there, mm -hmm. but the rest of it we're just not going to disagree about. So there's not going to be any advantage, mm -hmm. I think, to, yeah. to, to one worldview over another. Also, because I'm going to idealise a bit, I'm going to say it's not so much <laughs> what, what you believe right now, but what you believe if we improved it a bit. Right, like with back and forth, because you might have bad views about cats that could be easily corrected, right? Uh -huh. uh, so, so that's not going to be very important. The question will be maybe about the other way of going, the kind of, okay, so cats are made up of, part of <laughs> particles of some kinds, and we get down to fundamental particles or something like that. But mm. that doesn't seem to me like it's going to bottom out in any disagreement between us either. Right. I mean, we're, I assume, both quite ignorant about exactly how quantum chromodynamics works. I know nothing about quarks. Right. There's a level at which ignorance is just going to, to, to come in on that kind of decomposition. Mm -hmm. well, uh, look, but, look. but we're not going to argue about these things in our worldview because we're just going to agree on them. Right. This will reduce the mm -hmm. discussion to a small number of things. But you have to remember we're comparing the total worldviews and where there are differences, they matter. If there, if in fact it turns out there are differences. See, I, I'm wondering, that that's helpful, because I'm wondering if maybe some of the differences that would be most relevant would be in the sort of kind of fundamental, either, either causally fundamental or myriologically fundamental, um, whichever axis of fundamentality. Yeah. You start looking there at, at, at that sort of, sort of the roots of reality, if I could use that phrase, uh, or what you've called, Graham, the initial item. Um, and we start thinking about, we start theorizing about its nature. And then, then I'm wondering if um, maybe there's a way of making progress in terms of, um, I, I, let's say, reducing the number of primitive terms used to describe the roots of reality. Right. So, I mean, I agree. I mean, that, that was sort of where what I was saying was heading, right? We can, yeah. we, it'll turn out that there's a, there's a small number of places to focus our attention. Mm. Uh, unless it turns out that we do 
also have disagreements about um, hist- whether certain historical events happened or, mm-hmm. you know, what properties were instantiated in certain historical events and so on. But we can or whether I actually back. have a wife, right? Yeah. You believe I have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have evidence. For, I have evidence for that because I think that there are books dedicated to her. So that would be kind of odd on your part. Right? <laughs> it's all a ruse. No, I mean, this kind of gets into, if you guys want to cover anything there, we of course can. But this, of course, the talk about primitives is of course going to come in when we talk about... Um, qualitative and quantitative simplicity and then you know what the term natural is so if um again if you guys have anything else you need to cover of course that's fine but if you want to jump right in we can go into our next question which is kind of bleeds off what you guys are talking about which what is the role of natural in one's ontology should it be distinguished from physical things like that and i thought i was thinking about beforehand um if we need to do something else we can but i was thinking beforehand the best way to, to start this part of the conversation would be um, I know when I talked to Graham last time, when it was just he and I talking about naturalism, um, we talked about the definition of natural and naturalism. And so I was wondering, I felt like a good place to start with this might be um, to ask Josh what exactly you might have found in that definition or Graham's past definitions that's, um, I don't know if unsatisfactory is the word, maybe just like what you want more clarity on um, in terms of the way he's defined it in the past. It might be a good way to start. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very curious here about how to understand the term. Um, I think this is a primitive term for Graham and the way that cat is a primitive term. It's not to say that we can't understand its meaning. And, um, and so it's not to say I wouldn't understand its meaning, but I want to make sure it's very clear that my question about its meaning is not a dialectical move as part of a way of saying it's somehow a defective term. It's, it's not like that. I mean, I suffer from an inability. My wife will tell me she would verify this from an inability to understand like ordinary language. So I, I, I have that problem. Um, but I'm actually really curious whether I think that everything, whether that term natural expresses a type that is instantiated in everything. So, I mean, I do think that there are terms that instantiate types that are instantiated by everything. For example, I think that existence expresses a type that everything instantiates. I think self-identity is also that. Um, If we can allow for disjunctive types, self-identity or being a dinosaur, okay? Everything instantiates that. Um, So, you know, I'm I'm very open to the term natural expressing a type that everything instantiates. To be honest, part of my hesitation comes from my desire for simplicity. I mean, I wonder, you know, what, do we need this type? You know, I mean, maybe it's sort of obvious that you just sort of see it. Um, but I, I'm sure, Graham, you, you could help clarify that and help me to understand sort of what you're thinking, how you're using the term. So I think I wrote you an email about this at some point, so you would probably know what I'm going to say now. Um, so where did the word natural come from? Right. So w- that is, I'm going to talk about the etymological history mm-hmm. a little bit. Uh, and then suggest that there's a reason why we might not want to think that natural is a universal term that applies to everything that has to do with the history and then it's continued use, continued use since then. So what I think is that the word natural arose um, in so- somewhere way back in Christian theology as a word that applied to the stuff that God created, right? So there was a distinction. God was not amongst the natural things. The things things that were natural were the things that God created. That's not quite right because there may well be other things, angels, demons, heaven, and so on, that don't belong to the natural realm either. And the kind of delimitation of the natural realm is a bit smaller than just everything that God created, but it's among the things that God created. And the way that... um, the, the medievals who borrowed so much from Aristotle would have thought of it was the world as Aristotle described it roughly, um, leaving out the, um, the well, maybe even, maybe even including, if we're going back far enough, including all of the kind of spheres, right, the whole lot. That was the natural world, right, and it was governed by certain kinds of natural laws 
for Aquinas and for other medievals, that wasn't all that there was. There was more stuff besides that, but that stuff was not part of the natural reality. It was something additional. So that was, so the distinction between the natural and the non-natural was originally drawn in terms that relied on um, Christian theory, right? Mm-hmm. That um, people who came later decide and who didn't believe in the Christian theory, nonetheless preserved the word natural. Because mm-hmm. um, so, the, but it's just that what they took to be the world was just the natural world, rather than as the Christians saw it, the natural world plus a bunch more stuff as well. And the idea that what there is is the stuff that Aristotle thought that there was when he was giving his physics and biology and so on, except, of course, that he didn't have that theory right. Mm. That's, that's, that's what naturalists say there is. And typically, though maybe not always, um, people who are not naturalists think that there are more things and things that have properties that are not exemplified anywhere in that mm. natural reality. So that's, that's kind of how I understand the distinction uh, initially. It then turns out to be convenient um, to, because we're philosophers and we're used to the idea that sometimes you define terms for particular purposes, that I'll build more into the definition of natural than that. But that's not, that, that will, that's more for the um, squabbling purposes rather than the sort of understanding. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the, I that was just, the, the squabbling part of it might be kind of essential to the understanding because I'm thinking, so first of all, I, I want categorical uniformity. And I don't know why, but for some reason, when I think of natural, I have like a color in mind and I don't, it's like orange. So like, I imagine like everything in the world is just orange. You know, like that, that's great. Okay. You know, that's what I want. I want everything to be orange. Now, what if there's this initial item that has necessary existence? And, uh, and, and I think you and I are sympathetic with this view that there's a foundational thing um, that has a kind of necessary existence. And let's say it's orange, okay? It, it's natural. It, it's natural in the sense that um, it, you can investigate it through science. It's, uh, it, it's not magical. It doesn't break with reason. It's, um, it's, it's, it's intelligible. It's rationally investigatable. Um, it's natural in those sense. Um, it's under the same basic category as other concrete things in that it's a substance or a fundamental, uh, has, has a concrete nature. And then, you know, I mean, I wonder, terms are so tricky because, I mean, one could say that by definition, whatever's created by that initial item, we're going to call that natural. And then now we're just going to call that initial item supernatural, even though it's part of Graham's ontology and you wouldn't want to call it that. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't want to use that word. And, and I, I mean, I'm wondering if I'm actually in your boat with respect to this. Like, I'm wondering if it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word supernatural because I think there's sort of one color, one category that covers the created and the foundational. They're both sort of part of the same category, if that makes sense. My, my one caveat to that is that I would rather cut off the color too. Like why posit orange, right? So, <laughs> so, I mean, maybe this goes back to an earlier point, but like you and I agree that there are things like particles and people and planets, uh, you know, but why posit this other thing that sort of characterizes all of those things? I mean, we already agree that there's a difference between the created and the uncreated. We already, I think, have both in our ontology. And so, do, do you see what I'm trying, I'm trying to get at? I, I'm, and again, it's, it's, it's not that I'm calling to question the legitimacy of the meaning of the term. I, I'm just wondering if my actual view is natural in the way that yours is I, i'm wondering if, if there's an alignment here if that makes sense so maybe part of what's tricky here is the word natural has lots of other connotations mm-hmm. as well yeah. and you might think that there's a kind of 
uniformity, in my view and in yours, that is lacking in some other worldviews because there are ways in which the kind of causal initial thing is distinguished much more abruptly from yeah. everything else. Good way to put it. Uh, on my view, the causally initial thing is necessary, but that's all that distinguishes it from the stuff that comes afterwards. It's still um, going to be part of a spatiotemporal manifold if we now think in four-dimensional terms. It's just that it's kind of the, the initial surface mm -hmm. of it. Uh, so it's going to be continuous in lots of ways with what comes after. And there are, um, I mean, it, in some ways, I imagine it's very different. I mean, the part of the problem here is this is entirely speculative because we don't have any physics before the inflationary period. And it's exactly that bit that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So exactly what the, what the initial state of natural reality looks like is something that's still completely up for grabs. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's, it's not going to be radically distinct from what comes after it because we just have this kind of causal unfolding right now. Mm -hmm. There is a theme in some, but not all theology that makes God radically other from the creation, completely mm -hmm. different in kind, which gives you a whole bunch of discontinuities. Now you might or might not want to go that way. You might be worried about sliding into something that looks a bit more like pantheism or something like that if you don't preserve the kind of radical distinctness. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, that's just some thoughts. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I do have some sort of sympathies for a more imminent view of sort of the fundamental reality. Um, it's hard to sometimes distinguish these terms, but like panentheism versus classical theism... Yeah. Um, I think there's there's room there to explore, but um, may, maybe this could help us going forward. And I think this will lead into another one of the questions. If we um, compare sort of two different theories of the sort of initial necessary item, um, or let's say three. So, so one theory is that uh, we're going to say about this item that its sort of fundamental features are let's say, arbitrarily limited in some respect. When I say arbitrarily limited in some respect, I mean there's some sort of basic limits like in, in energy or in causal power uh, without further explanation, okay? Um, a, a second view would be that you sort of shave off the fundamental limits um, and it doesn't, instead it's, it, it, it doesn't have that sort of arbitrary limitation built within its fundamental nature, um, and then a third view would be you sort of leave it open. You say, well, I don't know, right? Like we, the science doesn't tell us. And so uh, sort of the modest thing to do is say, I just don't know. And I, I mean, I think all three of those different views are sort of important for sort of thinking about what's at stake. Um, but I, I want to say one thing first, which is that I think that just looking at simplicity and um, how much you're going to stick your neck out in terms of how much you're committed to that third view seems like it's the most attractive initially, the one where you just leave it open. And, and I wonder if we would at least agree on that. You just leave it open. You don't fill in that it has fundamental arbitrary limits. Um, because if you fill in that it has fundamental arbitrary limits, my thought is that then you're going to add some complexity to your theory. And, and then, and then if I could ask, two questions and I want to hear on both of these, um, if, if that seems right to you. And then second, if the term natural, well, let's say that one shaves off the arbitrary limits, then does one thereby have to not be a naturalist? This is where I'm wondering, am I a naturalist? Because I'm thinking shave off the arbitrary limits, everything else we keep the same and categorical uniformity and I'm a naturalist, but maybe, but maybe that doesn't count as naturalism. So what do you think? Okay. So one, one question will be about exactly what's going on when you're, when you're thinking about shaving off the arbitrary limits. So, mm -hmm. and that's a question about, so what attributes do you think this um, initial, at least causally initial, but maybe 
in some other there's there's more to it than that but this causal initial thing what kinds of properties does it have mm -hmm. if you're thinking about it as being conscious or having a mind or things like that then that won't be just a question of removing um sort of arbitrary limitations that i think are there in the or at least it doesn't seem to me that that's a question of removing arbitrary limitations. That's a question of adding lots of stuff, which I'm sure isn't there, right? Can I chime in on that? Yeah, or yeah, sure. you want to say more? No, I, no, I'm no, also... that's a, that, we can keep going. I, I, actually, I, I, I'm curious to hear, before I chime in on that, I'm going to interrupt myself here. <laughs> um, on the term natural again, I mean, just to get this clear, would you say that if one did just shave off the arbitrary limits and put aside the question of consciousness... <laughs> Would one thereby leave the ship of naturalism, or what, could one still be a naturalist at that point? Okay, so this is going to, as I said before, it depends a bit exactly how we're going to define the term naturalism, and that's kind of open. People say all kinds of different yeah. things. Well, I'm, I'm trying to enter your mind, like your definition. So, so I okay, but then for for different purposes, I've said different things about what I'm going to mean. By naturalism. But typically, one of the things that I include in my definition of naturalism, even though this is, um, lots of people wouldn't agree with this, is that the only minded stuff that there is is kind of late and local. It's the products of biological evolution. You don't get mind back there at the beginning. And I make that sort of constitutive of the worldview that I've got. Right now, you might say, okay, but then that's not really, that's not a very good way of understanding the term natural. It happens to be part of what I like to build into the term, but um, you might prefer that you might prefer not to use okay. the word that. No, that way. that helps. You me. might that prefer that I didn't use the word that way. No, that's good. That's very helpful to me, Graham, because it helps me see that if I have a view of the foundational item as including a kind of mind-like structure, that's where I'm going to get off of the naturalist boat. Well, that's your, one one, one place you'll get off. Yeah, on one definition. Of, okay, good. So that's another true. thing that, that I like to build in is something about worship worthiness as well, mm -hmm. because I think, because the origins of this, remember the, the kind of, the, ultimately this distinction between God and the, and the natural creation, but the people who were drawing that distinction were people who thought that God was at least sort of analogically minded and definitely worship worthy, mm -hmm. right? So... Yeah, okay, and that's related to what I was going to chime in about, which is what happens if you shave off the arbitrary limits. So my thought is that we can still say something positive about it. Um, it would still be an initial item. It would still have necessary existence. And I'm sort of thinking of necessary existence as a kind of value-making property or a great-making property of a thing. Um, and if, if that's right, then I'm thinking about, okay, let's say we shave off the limit to its degree of value, yep. then you get supreme value, and now you have a you know a supreme foundation. Yep. From there, we deduce some of the other attributes, but those attributes aren't built into the fundamental theory or the fundamental description. So, like every theory has infinitely many implications, right? But the infinity of the consequent of the theory doesn't diminish the intrinsic uh, probability of the theory. Um, and so that's that's where I'm thinking, like, okay, if, if I can shave off those limits then I'm, that's going to entail a kind of supreme nature, at least yeah. as I'm thinking of it. And then I'm not sure that this has a kind of complexity cost that makes this view sort of out of the gate behind the naturalist um, who has the arbitrary limits. Does that make sense? Like, because one of the things that was striking, to be honest, in, in your conversation with Micah um, in his last show was you took it to be that it was sort of obvious that theism has an ideological complexity cost. And, and I was thinking, well, may, maybe there's a way of defining those things so that at the end of the day, you're right. <clears throat> but it's not obvious to me. In fact, right. if anything, it almost seems the opposite. Like, you know, if, if, you, if you have this characterization of the foundation as having inexhaustible uh, value or inexhaustible some kind of supreme nature, that seems quite simple. And it's also very specific. So because if you have limits, then it sort of leaves open like, well, what those limits are, how much information it would take to describe those limits. So if you have a complete theory of its fundamental nature, it's just simply supreme. 
And then you get all these predictions. It's going to then have the supreme making attributes. And then this is where we can lead into predict, potential predictive success. But I think you hear what I'm proposing. Yeah. So, so one thing that, <laughs> excuse me, one thing that's interesting is your claim that um, you can deduce all this stuff from um, supremacy. So Jeff Speaks has a really nice recent book. I don't know if you've read it. And yeah, he's very, it. yeah, right. I have so a he's, on it. yeah, yeah, so do I. Um, he's, he's very skeptical. And I think there's something to his skepticism about how much you can get out of um, something like perfection or supremacy, what, what entailments that actually has. So I would be, there, there's something to argue about there, about your claim. I, I'm looking back because I, I have that book close to here. It might even be, well, I shouldn't spend too much time looking for it, but um, it's called The Greatest Possible Being. And um, that book, I read that book, uh, skeptical of his thesis, but by the end of the book, uh, I was persuaded. So actually, it helped me change my view on this. And I, I came to think that he was right, that the sort of uh, modal concept of a maximally great being is actually going to lead us into sort of dark territory where we're not going to be able to tease out some of the attributes, some of the classical attributes and make those deductions. And so it's interesting, you've written a review of it, and I've also published a review of the book as well. In the end, what that book helped me to do was to see that we need, I think, a, a non-modal, uh, more basic property, which interestingly enough, Graham, in your own book on describing gods, you have a chapter on perfection, and you talk about perfections yeah. as idealizations of positive properties. And I wasn't thinking that your characterization of per perfection was committed to a modal characterization, but mm. that could actually be kind of a prior light that could sort of illuminate even the modal landscape itself. So if there were a sort of idealization on value, sort of absolute perfection, um, if that were instantiated, that then would make non-trivial implications about what a maximally great being, uh, what would be the maximal greatness. Does that make sense? Uh, does that? Does yeah, that, yeah, it, maybe. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> it, it, what I was thinking was there's at least some work to do here yeah. to show sure. that you can actually get out lots of interesting consequences of the kind that you're going to need from the very simple characterization that you're imagining. And at least in, I because I, mean, I was also persuaded by, by what Jeff says in his book. Um, there have been people who claim for a long time that you could get that out of maximal being, and it really doesn't look like you can. So, Without this additional work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. Yes. Yes, but I do think that if we work with a kind of more basic notion of perfection or supreme value, um, it seems to, I mean, look, I could be wrong about this, but it just, my mind finds yeah. it intuitive that supreme value would imply certain kind of valuable uh, properties, including, and I wrote down kind of a list of, of p possible predictions. Um, let me just read this list. Necessary existence, a rational framework, such as logic or the logical landscape, a moral framework, um, prob uh, person building resources or probability raising resources for the emergence of moral conscious beings, as well as no just unjustified evil. And that last item is important because it shows how this theory, if, the, if those are real predictions of the theory, it does stick its neck out in a way that opens it up to um, the potential for being in conflict, perhaps, if you think there are unjustified evils or if, there's, if you think there's good evidence for that. But in any case, that there are these different properties that seem to non-trivially uh, flow from this more basic notion. And... Uh, so I don't know where you want to go from here, but... Yeah. Okay, so I want yeah. to go back and talk a little bit about the... Okay, so you thought there was either <clears throat> this initial thing, there are fundamental limits or there are no arbitrary limits or you just don't have a view about mm -hmm. that. On the, on the question, I think that as things stand, 
I don't have a view about what the limits of the <laughs> that thing are, what things might be limited there or otherwise, because it's going to be up to science to tell us what the properties of this initial thing are, if we're ever going to have any kind of good way of getting access to the properties of that initial thing. And maybe it's just something that we can't know about. So I'm not certainly not going to be committed to any positive characterization of what it's like. If, if So that's one thing. But the other thing is about exactly what arbitrary limits might amount to given that we're thinking that these things are necessary um as it's not clear that necessary being necessary and being arbitrary go very well together so, are you thinking because if it's necessary it doesn't admit of a further explanation something like this uh, so i'm thinking that if it's necessary uh, that's where explanation comes to an end, mm -hmm. right? Why is it so? Because it's necessary. Why is it necessary? Yeah, you don't get answers to that kind of question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because wonder... that's just where explanation ends. Yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. I, I wonder what you might think of this because I've been pondering this um, ever since our last conversation and oh, somewhat before that as well. I've been pondering the role of necessity in sort of stopping the chain of explanations. So, I mean, one thought is that contingency calls for an explanation in a certain way that necessity doesn't. Uh, there's something about its being so, despite the fact that it need not have been so, sort of calls for an explanation. Of course, it doesn't follow that necessity couldn't have a further explanation. Uh, you might think that in the sort of mathematical landscape or the landscape of abstracta, some abstract things are sort of like more fundamental than others. Um, and it's not, you know, I mean, you could talk about arbitrary limits with respect to numbers, you know, like pi has a certain, you know, decimal and that's arbitrarily limited, but then there's actually a deeper explanation even of the pi, you know, and what that is. And so I was thinking about, just to use a kind of concrete metaphor, I was thinking about the moon. You know, let's say that somebody proposes that the moon uh, has no deeper explanation because it is metaphysically necessary um, and its shape is metaphysically necessary. And then I want to say, well, let's explain things as far as we can. Um, you know, we actually have a scientific account. We have an account of the origin of the moon. Uh, we weren't there to observe the account is true. So it's not about just observation. It's about explaining the observations. And they might say, look, we can give a deeper account of the moon. And then if I say, well, but if the moon is necessary, then there's yep. nothing deeper to be said there. And I'm thinking, well, even if the moon, I mean, even if there is something necessary, it's like, are its features necessary, you know, or can we give a deeper explanation of those features in terms of something that's categorically unlike every other thing we know and experience to have a further explanation? Every limited thing seems to have a further explanation. So what I think is that um, every time that you say that something's necessary, that's a primitive commitment of yours. That makes your theory more complicated than a competing theory mm -hmm. which has something that's contingent and offers an explanation for its contingency. So there's going to be a problem with the theory that says that the moon's necessary. It's just it just feels kind of obvious that it's going to turn out to be a worse theory, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not getting any more explanation, but you've got this extra primitive in your, in I'm your theory. I'm with you on that. The, yeah, that seems the, right. So the, the, but once we start thinking about origins, if we're all going to go for a necessary origin, mm -hmm. then we just break even on that score, right? So it's not that, um, my saying that the whatever the initial state is is necessary um, isn't somehow a cost that you're not going to have a similar cost mm -hmm. for. That was that was the idea. Everybody, unless unless we're wrong about the relative merits of sort of brute contingency versus brute necessity or, you know, unexplained necessity mm -hmm. versus unexplained contingency, unless we're wrong about that. So there are, because there are people who, who would rather have 
brute contingencies rather than brute necessity. And there's a long history of people, especially on the, um, the, uh, sorry, let me turn that down. On, on the um, non, on, on naturalist side, just saying, why can't it just be a brute contingency, right? Yeah. The, the existence of everything, why can't it just be brutally contingent? I favour, and I think you favour, terminating things with necessities rather than mm -hmm. contingencies. But it's assuming that we do go that way, mm -hmm. um, it seems like we're going to be in the same boat. That's the, that's the thought. Yeah, we are in the same boat as far as that goes. And then I think maybe, I'm hopeful, we can take our lights and go a little further even within the boat. So, for example, let's say this, I like to use the concrete examples. Let's say that the initial item looks like this. This this specific shape and those colors. Okay, that that's the initial item. Now, I think we are, we're going to agree that... Um, that's probably not the most plausible account of the initial item. Uh, you know, better to even just leave open if it has a shape or what its shape would be. Okay. But my thought is, is that if it did have a shape, if it did look like a cup, then I would want to propose that we could actually give a deeper explanation of its shape in terms of perhaps more fundamental attributes that it has. And the structure of the reasoning here is explain as much as you can. So as long as you can continue that explanation, um, I think you've got good reason to go for it. Just as right. you have good reason to think that the initial item isn't a cup. Or at least that that's not its most fundamental nature. Right. So there might be something in my view that's hostage, slightly hostage to fortune because you might think that physics might one day to the deliver to us the view that the initial state has various kinds of complexity in it. Um, I suspect that it just won't go that way, um, but we're handicapped by not having any information about the initial state. That's the, that's the problem. So, um, as, as I said, when you offered your three um, levels here, the sensible thing to say is we don't know. We don't know what it looks like. But there's nothing that we've got now that says that it's got to have, uh, that it's got to be like the cup. So just to clarify, so this is actually very yeah. helpful and interesting to me. Would you say you don't know whether it has <coughs> basic limits? Or would you say that you think it does have basic limits? Or to put it differently, um, that you don't no, know whether it has a supreme nature? So, so I think about something that, that happens in elsewhere in physics. So think about the question about um, sort of arbitrary constants. Mm -hmm. um, we have theories, not final theories, not complete theories, in which there are certain values for certain things that just have to be put in by hand. There are lots of physicists who say that alone kinds of tells that alone kind of tells us that that's not final theory, I and mean, we have other reasons for thinking that it's not final theory. But in a final theory, there won't be things that you have to put in by hand, mm -hmm. right? So the hunch of physicists is there won't be arbitrary limits, right? There won't be these things that are just arbitrarily there in the final physical theory. Yeah. Right now, um, I don't know. What, what to right I, 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 I'm not sure where that where that leaves us I uh, it seems as though uh, we would have to wait and see right there's there's not going to be I mean they're they're speaking sort of in ignorance and abstractly there are different ways that this could go it could turn out that there are some of some of these values that as as theorists, we just have to put in there by hand this sort of thing that you would call an arbitrary limit. Maybe, maybe not. And I, it seems as though I'm in no position to make a judgment about that. Right. Uh, this is very interesting. I, I was smiling earlier because I was thinking about your work as a philosopher to try to gain an understanding of these things, even using 
arguments for modality as a reason to think that there is an initial necessary item, you're not sort of um, keeping yourself at bay until the scientists sort of figure all this out precisely yeah. because there are some other considerations. And I mean, when I think about it, I think about the, uh, the, the non-trivial inferences from certain grand scale theories that scale across domains that aren't really squarely in the purview of uh, what physicists are focusing on. So for example, let's say I shave off arbitrary limits. This leads me to a supremely, a supreme nature. And then I, I begin to think about some deductions. And yes, this will take work per the points we talked about before. But um, let's say I deduce from a supreme nature the supreme attributes of a, a, a supreme logical landscape, a supreme moral landscape, a supreme person building resources. And then I think, okay, well, probably the physicists aren't going to be considering axiology or uh, even the nature of mathematics, the philosophy of mathematics in their theorizing. And so while their fundamental physics is going to be helpful to me, it's going to give me some useful data to think about things. My worry is that uh, there's they're taking into account a limited set of data relevant to this inquiry. And, and this is the kind of inquiry that you are equipped to help the scientists with by bringing in other data, other considerations. And I guess maybe my worry is almost like you're, you're, you're cutting yourself short. You're saying scientists have to tell me about this, but actually you have light to bring on the, on the topic. Um, but scientists do have to, right? There's, there's a causally continuous network of stuff here. And uh, I'm, I think that the record, the historical record of people telling sort of, sort of on a priori grounds, telling physicists how the world has to be is just not great right i mean that so so i would be very reluctant to go that way at least i mean i i agree that there are distinctions between some a priori speculations that have not turned out correct but then there are other a priori principles that are maybe clearer such as principles of uh logic that underwrite science itself um so I wonder if okay that maybe takes we can us bring back. more yeah maybe that takes us back to questions that to where we started with the, okay so what's in the background <laughs> mm -hmm. here um, we couldn't um, so so I, so so there's a question about. So going right back to this question about worldviews, about, okay, so what can differ between worldviews and what resources are left to evaluate worldviews? Where do those resources come from? Um, can we disagree about logic in our worldviews? There are, after all, people who go for classical logic and people who go for some kind of non-classical logic and pluralists who think we don't have to choose, right? Uh, pickle, but but if logic is up for grabs in the the choice between worldviews, okay, one of the resources that are left to us to make the choice, right, mm -hmm. when we're we're arguing the merits between the two. Um, so one one thing you might say is, well, look, we just have to. For the purposes of what we're doing, there's got to be agreement on a bunch of things. Logic's one of them. There's a bunch of other things that we have mm. to just agree on. And then we don't have this problem now, right? The scientists are just in the same boat as us when it comes to there's a bunch of um, there's a bunch of resources in probability theory and logic and various other things, maybe even some little bits of metaphysics that they can just help themselves to. Yeah, I'm very sympathetic with that. Actually, I, I sometimes will tell people that the boundaries between science and philosophy are kind of blurry. And 
it might be that I'm a scientist of the foundations, depending on how you define science. I mean, if, if we can give a scientific account of the foundation, then hopefully um, science is going to include all the data, as you said, including data about our logical systems, the axiological landscape, value, uh, consciousness. And, and then in that case, um, well, in that case, aren't we, we're, we're part of the team. I mean, we're, you and I, Graham, like we're part of, the team. <coughs> we're among those working on this, right? So one other question I'd like to ask is about, um, so I think that what we've been talking about is about whether there's something that's initial, mm -hmm. uh, whether the initial thing is all there is to the foundations is another question that requires some consideration. Uh, I don't think, but um, there's going to be room for arguing about this too, that we should expect the thing that's going to be causally initial, the kind of the boundary of the, the physical universe, to have anything interesting to do with values or with logic um, or with consciousness or with whether there are justified evils or not. I'm expecting that, for example, that because logic's necessary and morality's necessary, um, that in a certain sense, the foundations are independent. Uh, and I'm not sure that there's going to be uh, that there'll be any advantage in trying to build those things into a single foundation. Anyway, this is something else too. I, I hope, yeah, I, this is, it's, it's, this is helpful because I've, I've thought about the value of sort of simplifying your root explanation, even of necessities, right? So in mathematics, uh, you have all of these different mathematical truths and then the mathematical uh, theorists are looking for more basic axioms that at least entail or successfully predict or from which you can deduce those truths. And if those axioms um, are successful in that way, then you have a deeper, more unified explanation. It would be sort of like if you just looked out in the sky and you saw some a configuration of matter saying, this configuration of matter necessarily exists and it exists because of the necessary nature of God. It's like, I would think, even if that matter did necessarily exist, uh, it's going to be better explained in terms of something not nearly so, how should I say, epistemically surprising, apart from a more simplifying explanation. Just in the same way that the axioms of mathematics give you a kind of, I struggle for words here, but epistemically sort of like, simpler there's fewer pieces here and then that provides a kind of advantage to simplifying your ultimate theory of things okay so there's some interesting questions about axiomatization in particular about the connection in mathematics between axiomatization and kind of epistemic access um you know i mean you'll know that russell for example said that um you don't believe um, other things because you believe the axioms, rather it's the other way around. You believe a lot of other things. And then, so you believe that these are the axioms because you've got this nice simple set. And so the reason to believe in the axioms is because the more accessible things that you believe are now things that you can get out of the axioms. Uh, so I'm, there's a kind of broader question about the value, about the role and the value of axiomatization in theories. Um, there are reasons why you want to axiomatize um, that maybe don't have much to do with considerations about why you should accept the theories overall, so that axiomatization isn't actually that important in theory choice. So th this is something I've been thinking about quite a bit recently, and I can't say that my thought is kind of very settled about it, but I am kind of skeptical about um, the role that axiomatization of theories is going to play 
in the kind of working out the kind of relative um, virtues of worldviews, as opposed because you are, I don't think that you can read commitments off axioms. This is something I touched on before, uh, and it's very hard to to read off the explanatory virtues from the axioms. Also, depending upon whether we're thinking of the axiomatization as taking in um, the data. As, so that you're kind of axiomatizing everything. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, just one kind of final thought on this. This is very interesting. And I think this is an area for new research. And, um, you know, if people are watching this and they're thinking about a dissertation to work on, this would be an area. Um, but, you know, it, it does strike me that, like, in mathematics, I had a math professor friend at Notre Dame when I was there, and he would talk about sets, set theory as being kind of foundational to other branches of math. And there was something appealing to him about that precisely because you have this kind of simpler set of principles that kind of unifies a wide range of principles. And, uh, and I, I think that's sort of how I'm, I'm thinking of large scale theories of the world. Uh, you know, let's try to have the simplest ultimate explanation of things as far as we can. Uh, I think we might agree on that as a general approach, but maybe there are some differences here in the details of axioms. <laughs> right. So in the case of, of um, say, set theory as foundational for, for the rest of mathematics, it's it's an interesting question in what sense that's true, right? Because if I give you just the axioms of set theory and I say, okay, um, prove the fundamental theory of groups from this set of axioms, you can't do it. You need some more definitions yeah. for starters in order to do it. So anyway... Yeah, no, and that that's totally true. I mean, this is related to the sort of more work that needs to be done to deduce from a theory of the foundation certain implications um, in terms of definition and clarifying terms. And I agree that, I mean, this is actually one of the debates I had with my math professor friend because he would say things about sets that I would think aren't metaphysically correct. <laughs> so we talked about that. But, um, but I think yeah, I think that just the general thought that there's something about trying to simplify your ultimate explanation. Um, there, there's some value there. And uh, it seems like that value doesn't stop with contingency. I think that's kind of the, the big thought here is even when you reach a kind of necessary item, you can talk about the attributes of that necessary item. And, you know, it, is it shaped like a cup? Is it shaped like a turtle? Uh, and my thought is, well, if you can give a further explanation, if you can simplify your ultimate explanation, then there seems to me to be an advantage there. Sure. So this, the necessity here isn't just the necessary existence, but necessity of possession of properties mm -hmm. as well, right? So it's the kind of the, the, the initial state the way I've usually said it, the initial state is necessary, right? And so that includes um, perhaps there being some things. It depends exactly how the initial state is. And there being some way, right? and all of that is supposed to be necessary, um, not just there's a thing whose existence is necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we got a, if we can jump in here for a second, uh, you actually you <coughs> skipped ahead on the list earlier to the, I think it was like question six. And so actually, I had a couple questions actually for clarification. And if you guys covered it and I somehow missed it, I apologize. But actually, that was supposed to be Joe's question. So Joe, if you had any more questions for um, clarification on the arbitrary limits, I, I had a couple more direct questions there. But I, so I figured you would too. Um, I know we lost you for a second. We were just talking about some science and stuff. But um. <laughs> That was supposed to be your question. So if you had any more, like if you had some questions for a clarification, I'm sure you do on like the arbitrary limit side of things. I know I had a couple. So um, do you have anything there, Joe, to go, kind of skip to that question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess one question for Josh is perhaps if he could sort of um, 
expand upon the relationship between principle of arbitrary limits and um, I guess certain doctrines of Christianity, for instance, Trinitarianism. So one might think that um, there seems to be a sort of limit there within God um, or within God. Uh, you know, like the three persons, it's not two persons, it's not one person, it's not four, it's not ten or it's not ten billion. Um, I know like Swinburne has, has an argument where uh, from the nature of love or a uh, if I'm recalling correctly, that like three is explained by some more deeper fundamental principles. Um, mm -hmm. And I know Felipe touched on that in your dialogue as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I'm wondering if you could expound on, on whether or not this sort of seems as though it's a, a limit or a violation of, I, I don't want to say violation, but you know, sure. maybe a little bit of tension with the principle in, in Trinitarianism. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I think what I want to say is like either it is or it isn't. Okay, first, to so start with something clear and safe, either it is or it isn't. Um, if it is, uh, if, if the Trinity sort of adds fundamental complexity and adds arbitrary limits, then I would say I've got a reason against that particular view. And I want to let the light of reason lead me into a deeper understanding of reality, whatever that is. So that's the first thing I want to say. And I really want to emphasize that. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I think the principle applies the way that I'm using the principle, it applies to fundamental limits. And so it could be, I mean, you mentioned Swinburne, that there's a kind of argument from the fundamental nature of an unlimited thing yeah. to it's having certain distinctions within it, uh, distinct properties, distinct personalities. And so um, for the purposes of this conversation, I want to just leave that open because I can't see how to decide that um, using the tools at hand. Okay. Do you have anything, Graham, or on the Trinitarian So, point? So that sounded kind of similar to the line that I wanted to take about the initial state of the universe, actually. It seems oh, yeah. rather similar. Yeah. More common ground. We can feed more back into the agreement section <laughs> on methods of inquiry. That's awesome. I mean, Do you have anything? You're going to bridge it into sort of consciousness and the nature of mind and... Is that where you were going to bridge it? Um, not next, because I, I had another question on like point three come up while they were talking yeah. or something from their email exchange I wanted to touch on. But are you good on the arbitrary point for now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The only thing I wanted to say is um, you guys went back and forth a little bit on this in your email exchange, so I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on it too. Um, I wanted to ask, particularly you, Josh, then see what Graham said about um, the point you guys were talking about, and I'll let you make it because I'll probably botch it, but the point about whether or not naturalism precludes theism, or I think the language you used was precludes supremacy. And mm -hmm. um, and so you guys talk a little bit about um, like ontological simplicity and commitment and like theoretical predicates. So whether or not these predicates have non-zero extension and whether or not those predicates then count as part of baggage. So again, I'm not spelling that out perfectly, but I wondered what you guys thought about that point. Yeah, so this conversation helped me. Um, Graham helped clarify some things here because um, I was wondering whether, first, uh, my view of a foundation as supreme is a problem, whether that precludes naturalism. I was wondering that. And now I think I understand that uh, there is a, a definition or an understanding of natural that Graham will use in certain contexts where if the fundamental reality has a personhood or consciousness, or is mind-like, um, then it won't count as natural. And so this helps me because if shaving off arbitrary limits implies that it has a supreme nature, and then having a supreme nature implies that it has supreme uh, qualities, including um, a supreme mind and supreme knowledge, then that will entail that, um, that it's not a natural object uh, in, in those terms. And, and so then I guess the further question would be, well, then is, is that a sort of complexity cost? And there, I think that it's it's not because I think what's going on here is you, you've arrived at sort of the fundamental reality and now you, you have a choice. Either it has these arbitrary limits or it doesn't. It, it, each, e either, either thing you say contains information. And, and I can't see that, that um, saying that it has none of these arbitrary limits is going to add more information than saying it has arbitrary limits. I mean, if anything, I would think that the specification of a limit 
it's going to contain even more information. Um, but then there's the third way, which is sort of leaving it open. If you leave it open, then of course you're saying less. And so the less you say, the less likely you're, you are to be wrong. That's always true. Okay. Do you have anything you wanted to touch on there, Graham, with natural and predicates and all that and entailment? Um, I guess the only thing I would <coughs> add to this part of the conversation is that the question isn't just about the simplicity of the foundational thing when we're talking about the simplicity about the <clears throat> how the views are doing in minimizing their commitments it depends on what else you're mm -hmm. committed to so what difference does the differences in the commitments to you know what's there in the, the initial thing i'll call it what difference does that make to commitments elsewhere um, and I wouldn't draw any conclusions and th or think that much interest is going to attach to the question about the, okay, so who's got the, who's got the simpler initial thing, unless we also thought that there were no, absolutely no consequences that flowed from that in, for simplicity elsewhere down the track. Right, so that's the only, only thing. That's part of the reason why uh, I'm not too fussed to say the, by, by the, obviously there's lots of stuff that we just don't know about the initial thing. So it makes it kind of hard to do this evaluation of simplicity, right? If we've got disagreements about exactly what the initial thing is. Okay. Okay. Um, did you have anything there, Josh? Or uh, I don't think so. Um, I think Graham's right that one has to consider the implications of the theory, and that simplicity by itself is going to leave too much open. Um, I mean, for example, if you think that shaving off the arbitrary limits entails that the initial item has a supreme nature, which you then think, for another reason, would imply that it wouldn't create a world like this world. Um, that's going to be a positive reason. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's wor at work in, in Graham's thinking about this. And so, and that's valuable. I think that that's a way forward. In fact, maybe this will be my final thought on this is I think it's actually helpful for anybody who's coming to these questions to kind of frame it in terms of, okay, what is the hypothesis? Uh, what does it predict? And uh, what does it explain? And are there competing hypotheses that can better explain the data and are as simple, if not simpler? And so I think this is, this is actually, actually a point of great agreement where it, it's, a, it's a way of, this is what I'm trying to say is, it's a way of people making personal progress as they think about this using these tools. Because I think sometimes when we talk about what we know, what we're talking about is what sort of the experts have come to an agreement upon, which is almost like nothing. So it feels like you can't know anything. But actually, I think you personally can see things that uh, the experts, I mean, there is this question, you know, about what to do when experts disagree. But I mean, a clear example of this would be in consciousness, I think people can know through powers within them that they have thoughts and feelings, even though the experts don't agree on that. We don't know whether you have thoughts and feelings, uh, if eliminativist materialism is true, for example. And so anyway, I, I, just, I just want to kind of maybe close this part of the conversation by talking about the value of sort of framing the inquiry in terms of hypothesis and prediction for each individual on their journey to investigate and that you can actually come to see things from your own perspective, even while the experts are still disagreeing about it. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, sorry, to, I, don't, I do want to, we can move into consciousness, but I just had one point here. It seems like we, we pinned down a little bit earlier, um, at least that Josh, you think that now like Graham's, at least how he's defining natural in some context rules out, um, 
uh, foundation having a mind or being mental. And that's, of course, a deviation a little bit from how, like, say, Felipe Leon characterized his mm -hmm. liberal naturalism. So I, I wonder, and I, I don't want to stay too long on the arbitrary limits point, but it's one of the more, I think it's one of the more important parts of this. And so I, I just wonder then, on your view, then, wouldn't it be the case that um, Graham's view of natural and naturalism then would entail arbitrary limits? Because you guys kind of talked about it, and Graham, you sort of wanted to leave it open. But if it's the case that on Graham's definition of natural and naturalism, that rules out the foundation being <clears throat> mental, um, does that count, do you think, Josh, as an arbitrary limit? And if so, like, you obviously think we have motivation to shave it off. And so I kind of wonder what you guys think. There. I want to just say sense? I do think so if shaving off arbitrary limits implies a supreme nature, which then implies personhood. And Graham might have questions about those inferences. Um, but I do think those inferences go through. So I do think that um, Graham's naturalism would preclude that. Right. Whereas I think if we're talking about, I mean, th there's a different way of thinking about this. Um, if the, the arbitrary limits on values are values other than zero and infinity, I go zero for consciousness. That's not arbitrary. So um, it doesn't, you know, it looks fine to me, even if I went with the no arbitrary limits. The, you're not, and, and the same will go for a bunch of other things. They'll go the same way, right? Down the list of implications, right? So I'm thinking, yeah, go to no, the no, root. Sure. Yeah. So, so I'm not thinking about, I mean, it's a separate question. Yes. Whether, whether you can get there by an indirect route, but on the, just thinking about it directly, um, there's nothing, not going to be anything arbitrary about yeah. this. There's no consciousness there. Yeah. And I think that's what you should say. I mean, and I think that even explains precisely why people who wouldn't think that there's an initial supreme being wouldn't think that there's any degree of consciousness. Apart, yeah. I guess, for certain panpsychists, but um, but even yeah. then, if you're a panpsychist, shave off the arbitrary limits and have a supreme conscious <laughs> thing. You know, but um, but yeah, no, I think that's that sounds right to me. So, so the question that raises for me is: Can there be limits then that are non-arbitrary? Because it seems to me, at least intuitively plausible, that to say the foundation is not mental that may be a limit but it sounds like you know graham thinks it's sure it's a limit but it's not arbitrary because i can give you know without getting into like possibly the ramifications so then that raises the question for me then we're talking about this foundation is like well can there be limits that aren't arbitrary and we can kind of give these sort of varying deeper accounts explanation. Of, i think yeah. so yeah this relates to the trinity question right i mean if there's a deeper explanation of the limit uh, it's not really arbitrary in that sense okay good okay that clears yeah. it up for yes. me then yeah. All right. So uh, if we're good, then, um, Joe, I think we can move into consciousness if we want to. We had a section on there. And Joe, you were going to take that. Are you ready to move in there? Or do you guys have anything else you want to any closing remarks? Are we good on that section for now? Good there? Fine. I'm good. Yeah. OK, Joe, you ready to jump into consciousness then? OK, so number four on our list for questions was a pretty big question. <laughs> We've gone out of order, but it's all right. <laughs> Um, so I guess, um, when we're thinking about the theory of the foundation, I mean, I know Josh, you pointed this out in some of your Facebook posts is that, I mean, it's either mental or non-mental, right? I mean, it's either a mind or mind-like, or it's not. And, um, we know that there are minds. So of course there's going to be a question of construction, right? If we're starting with non-mental resources, if we're starting with, uh, physical or, um, uh, natural resources, it's going to be... It's actually, it's going to be difficult to build up or construct something with the sort of first personal effective consciousness, phenomenal mm. consciousness like that. Um, so I guess uh, I, I can turn it over to both of you guys, um, uh, the nature of consciousness and, and how it relates to mind first versus non-mind first or non-mental first. Uh, first as in the order of, you know, uh, foundational, more foundational, more explanatory um, yeah, so I'll turn it over to you guys. We could probably start with Josh, say. Okay, so um, there's a lot here. And uh, one thing that I like to do is sort of focus on what's clearest first and sort of let the light of clear, let the light of the clear kind of shine into what might be less clear. And so I think it's helpful to think about the nature of consciousness. And, and I was thinking about this again today, actually just driving here for the interview. And I was just thinking about um, two powers that people have to investigate the nature of consciousness that 
I think people don't necessarily know they have these powers or they're not, not explicitly stated among the powers that they have because people think of the five senses, but they don't necessarily think of these other powers. <clears throat> and these powers are first your power by which you can see that you have thoughts and feelings, the sort of inner light by which you can know what you're, what's on the inside of you um, in your consciousness. And then second, a power of seeing distinction. So the thought here is that whatever's within your immediate awareness, um, let's say you have an image in your mind in your visual field of a blue square, okay? You can actually see first by the power of that inner light that you're having an image of a blue square without checking your brain, without looking at what the particles are doing. You just see it. And second, you can see that that blue square is not the same thing as a red square image, maybe over on the other side. And this is, I take this to be sort of a basic power. You just see it. Um, now, somebody might say, well, maybe blue and red, you know, we can reduce blue to red. You could say blue is really just a form of red. Um, philosophers sometimes talk about the difference between reduction and elimination. Um, and these things can be hard to tease apart sometimes because it might look like if you're saying the blue just is a form of red, you're really just eliminating the blue or at least that blue as it seems to be doesn't exist. And that's what John, actually, John, John Searle, Searle makes this point in his, in his book, um, probably in several places, but uh, yeah. So, okay. So why is this relevant to consciousness? Well, when I was in graduate school, we studied all these arguments. Okay. And then after graduate school, I began publishing my own thinking about the topic of the philosophy of mind. But what I noticed is that like all of these arguments, whether it's, uh, multiple realizability, Chinese room argument, zombie arguments, you know, all the, what Mary, Mary, the the colorblind neuroscientist arguments, like all these arguments ultimately are no better than the premises. And you can't verify the premises unless you use these powers, uh, the, 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 these powers of introspection together with a power of seeing distinction. Maybe in some of the arguments, you have to use a kind of modal power to see possibilities. And, and if you limit yourself to like your just your five senses, your sort of powers to see shapes um, or, you know, what your eyes are picking up, then you're not really going to be able to verify the truths of any of the premises in any of these arguments. And once I saw that, once that became clear to me, at least for my own self, when I consider it, it, it became just sort of obvious that, OK, I can just see that I'm having some thoughts and I can actually see that certain thoughts are different from other thoughts just directly in a basic way i can and, and i can make other comparisons like like a shape of a of a triangle is not the same thing as a sense of sadness i can have both in my immediate awareness and i can compare them now sometimes in, in the literature people will talk about these counter examples like water and h2o or hesperus and phosphorus they'll say well doesn't it look like those are different uh, but in those cases Kripke talks about opaque context. He says, he says that if there's an opaque context where you don't have a direct awareness of the item, it's outside of your immediate awareness, then you could, it's a kind of a matter of speculation what it actually is. So you, you use science, you use inference to see what it actually is. And that's where you come up with these sort of uh, a posteriori identities or identities that you establish through scientific means. But when it comes to things that are within your immediate experience, then it seems to me that you can actually verify directly. Uh, you know, if, if you have um, shape and extension and separation and color and consciousness all in your own immediate experience, you can you can just inspect those things and you can uh, you can actually make distinctions there. And so this is one of the reasons, um, not my only reason, but this is one of the reasons that I think that you can't actually reduce consciousness to patterns of, uh, of particles, to be to, to put it simply and crudely. Um, and so this is relevant to the nature of consciousness, and it's relevant to the kind of reality that we're in, because if there are these sort of irreducible conscious elements, well, I mean, first, this is exactly what a Supreme Foundation would seem to predict. It, it would seem to predict that there's this positive uh, property of mind and... Um, and 
it would also have the resources to produce mines, it seems to me. Of course, there are other questions to ask about construction, and so this leads open, leaves open a lot to discuss. But those are some of my initial thoughts uh, on that. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure what to say. Uh, so I'm an I'm a identity theorist. I think that – so I'm, I'm not – and a limitivist, and I'm not a reductionist either, right? I say that when you're conscious, that's just a matter of your being having certain kinds of neural functioning going on in you, right? That's all there is to being conscious. Likewise, to perceiving, it's just a matter of there being certain kinds of processing going in on you that going on in you. That's that's related in the right, right way to your environment and that has the right kind of um, environmental and longer term history, evolutionary history as well. And so on for all the other kinds of um, dimensions of mindedness that you can mention, including introspection, which is something that you can do, um, and um, thought and so on. What I think about the argument that you just gave is that it doesn't touch the identity theory because you can't just by introspecting or just by looking tell that you, that these things that are, that you're thinking about your consciousness, your thoughts, and so on are not neural processing. You can't see that directly. There's an old paper of Armstrong's, I think it was called The Headless Woman Illusion or something like that, a very short paper in analysis where he makes that point in, I think, quite a convincing way, though, of course, people who are not identity theorists might think otherwise. Right, so um, there are advantages to the identity theory. There are various kinds of advantages to it, but I'm not going to focus on that. Here, I just want to make the point that um, the kind of considerations that you've given, while they may well tell against reductive theories and eliminativist theories, don't tell at all against identity theory. Well, in, in, my, may, view. in, my, in my view. It totally makes sense. And actually, mm -hmm. if I may point to one of the advantages of identity theory, there is a simplicity advantage, potentially, yeah, sure. because here you have fewer types. Um, consciousness just is. This other thing that we already independently have evidence yeah. for. So at least consciousness in you just is this other thing. I mean, there's yeah. a there's a kind of subtlety here because otherwise you end up saying that the only things that are conscious are humans or something like that. And that nothing sure. else could be. So so it has to be a kind of restriction on the yeah the the typing. But the kind of view. I mean, if you're familiar with the literature, the kind of view that Lewis defends in Mad Pain and Martian Pain is very close to the view that I like. So, so I'm actually curious yeah. to just explore this a little bit with you. So um, when I think about it, when I think about my own thoughts and my own feelings, it strikes me that I have crystal clear certainty that I have thoughts and feelings, especially when I'm having one and I focus on it. Mm -hmm. like, let me get an example. Let me not go by memory. Okay, I'm now <coughs> thinking that Joe is cool. I don't know why that thought just came to my mind. <laughs> there it is. Um, <laughs> now, to be very honest and be very frank with you, I don't have that same kind of feeling about whether there are particles even in my brain or even that I have a brain. Like, on the evidence that I have, I might not have a brain. No, I <laughs> probably do. But this is a kind of probabilistic inference that um, – is not is a difference. It seems like a, a clear difference between my belief that I had that thought about Joe and any kind of neural structure <laughs> in my brain. I mean, and I just, some distinctions are worth making here. I'm not saying that my thought is unconnected to my brain or that there isn't a kind of interaction or I'm not even saying that I have I, I'm two substances. I actually kind of like a sort of monism where I'm one thing, one substance. And I have a variety of attributes, like I've got uh, the attribute of having atoms and having thoughts. And these aren't the same attribute. And I just use my power of direct, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear more about why it is that you're thinking that 
I mean, this isn't really an argument as much as it's like pointing. I'm just like pointing to something like a thought and then pointing to something else like a shape and just saying they're not the same because both are in immediate experience. Now, maybe you'll say the neural structure is not in my immediate experience. So it could well be that. Um, but then that almost sounds like idealism because <laughs> it's almost like you're basically saying that which is uh, what outside of my immediate experience really is. So how, how does this really work? Because I mean, the neural structures aren't in my immediate experience. Like I, no, I can't tell you what the... So, so what you're... T okay, but you've got to distinguish between the content of your experiences and what your experiences are, right? Oh, so, so there's certain kinds of... Um, I'll, I'll, I mean, it's complicated because there are states and processes. There's a lot of different things to distinguish here. I'll just talk about processing, mm -hmm. right? But um, that will just cover... That's just meant to cover a range of different things, whether we talk about states or processes or something else, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, so your neural processing has certain kinds of contents, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's how it goes, right? So w when you're doing certain kinds of processing, the contents of that processing is there available for you. Um, because you're doing the processing. That seems right. That's, I that's, agree that's, with that's that. How the, that's how the view goes. So there's no there's no distinction between there's no distinction because there's an identity here. The your consciousness, your perceptions, your feelings, your thoughts, and so on is all stuff happening in your brain. That is, might be is, right. Is, I mean, is, I, I... Is, is the view, and there's nothing in. I, it seems to me there's nothing in the kinds of considerations that you gave that counts against that view, and there are independent reasons for thinking that it's right. Those reasons don't come from introspection. You could never get to that view from introspection. Right? So th th but, that, is... but there's lots and lots of other evidence to do with the behaviour of other people, the behaviour of animals, the result of neural insult to people and animals and a whole lot of other stuff that makes it the most economical and most satisfactory explanation of all the data. That's the that's where you and that's how you get to it. You certainly if if you do a day cart and you go and lock yourself up with your stove and you just sort of sit there and um, cogitate, you will not get to the correct view about the nature of the mind that way. You just right. want this, this, are you familiar with some of Schwartz's work? Um, so it, I've read some of the sort of latest studies in neuroscience indicating um, material changes that seem to happen posterior and or with uh, conscious uh, intentionality where those material changes aren't accounted in terms of prior material states. Uh, I mean let me be careful here because the scientific data is open to wide ranges of interpretation. <clears throat> um, but as far as I can tell, the best science that we have as of recent seems to support a kind of two way causal interaction where you have conscious intentions that have impact on the brain, the frontal lobe, um, as well as obviously if you hit somebody's brain that will affect their consciousness. Um, but what intrigues me is the studies, that seem to indicate that there are effects in the brain that are a result of conscious intentions where those very material effects are not predicted by any known material process, uh, which of course isn't to say that there couldn't be some unknown process, but it's just if you're thinking about the best explanation of the scientific data that we have, um, that there's actually two-way causal interaction. I'm curious if you're so, sort of familiar yeah, with okay. that. Yeah, so, okay, so I haven't had a look at this. Uh, it sounds to me a bit as, as though it might, I mean, ju just thinking about it, um, there, was a, there was a time when the Libet free will experiments got oh, everybody sure. very excited, and it just turned out that, the, that mistakes were being made mm -hmm. in the interpretation of the experiments. So um, it will be necessary to go and have a look, which I haven't done. And I do have um, quite a few connections to um, 
to people who work in the the interface between philosophy and neuroscience. Mm. And it's certainly not the impression I get from them that this is where the um, fundamental research in neuroscience is pointing. So I, I would expect that the studies are quite controversial as well. Yeah, well, I mean, it, me too, because of these sort of philosophical framings. I mean, just to go back to um, the type identity, I, I wonder if actually we might have a little more alignment here than it might have seemed initially after hearing you talk. Um, so there's token identity and there's type identity. And there's an important difference between those because um, on token identity, you could have it that a conscious state is one of the same token as a neurophysical state. Um, and, and I'm actually open to that. Let me clarify what I mean by that. Um, you can have one token or one item that has multiple aspects or properties. It instantiates multiple different types. And um, it almost sounded like you were advocating more of a, a sort of a token identity where the consciousness is sort of instantiated by a kind of neural physical process, which isn't to say that every aspect of consciousness that I witness first person through introspection, that very feeling of, let's say, happiness right now or curiosity is really more my feeling right now. Uh, just is a shape or function or gray matter, um, even if they're both sort of instantiated in one state or one process. Because what, the, the reason why I'm saying this is because when I hear you saying that my argument or my thoughts don't really touch against your thought, I'm wondering if you might even be pointing to a place of alignment here where there's a sort of vocabulary problem. Um, and that we can clear up this vocabulary problem with some precision in terms of the difference between token and type identity. I doubt it. I've, <laughs> I doubt it. Um, in, in this case. Um, um, hmm. I'm just trying to think about I mean, the, the the vocabulary here is kind of tricky, and the, the the vocabulary that I use, and maybe it doesn't map very well onto the type token um, distinction that you're trying to draw, um, and so I'm struggling a bit to know what to say in response to to that. Uh, the so so I have this view. And which I want to say the kinds of things that Jack Smart used to say about believing, perceiving, reflecting, and so on. Uh, and it's, you know, you're believing just is, and then you say a bunch of stuff, right? Now, that just is needs some unpacking, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of it as, a, as identity. Right, there's there's nothing more. There's nothing else. This is it, right? So when, <coughs> so when um, you look at a red thing, right? There's something that it's like for you to see that red thing, but that there's something that it's like is arises directly from the neural processing. Well, it just is it. It just is it. It just is the neural processing, right? And the can can um, can Mary in the the um, the black and white room know what it's like to see red? Well, not unless she can get herself into a state of seeing red in the Chinese room, because that's that's what it takes to know what it's like. You have to be in the state, right? There's the we. I mean, assuming certain imaginative limitations. If you've never had Vegemite, you just don't know what it tastes like, mm -hmm. right? But when you do, there's this bunch of processing that goes on. And that is your, I mean, we're going to say it's kind of constitutes you knowing what it's like. Yeah. Well, constitutes like an emergence from. Yeah. And well, I want to, like and that I should or, be very careful because yeah. the view is, the view is an identity view. And so I don't, although it's very easy to slip into talk yeah. that suggests emergence or constitution or things like that. That's not the view. 
Yeah. And distinguishing between type identity and token identity, I think yeah. is helpful here because I mean, it just strikes me when I think of a certain thought or a certain feeling. And if you say, well, that feeling of love or that feeling of curiosity or the entailment between two propositions or two thoughts in my mind just is a pattern. And it's not just that they emerge from or they're connected to yeah. or constant. It just is that. I mean, just to be as honest as I can, it's just like my mind says, that's like saying true just is false or black just is a form of white. It's just like, yeah, just, sure. no, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and interestingly, for lots of people, it just goes the other way. What else could it be? <laughs> well, maybe the only thing it could be if it were material would be a neural process. You know, I mean, that, that's kind of what I wonder is like if you have a materialist frame, I, I've noticed in the fill surveys, it's sort of interesting because in the philosophy of mind, you actually have more uh, skeptics of a completely material view in the philosophy. Well, let's see. How does this go? Among philosophers of mind, um, there's a higher degree of leaning towards atheism than leaning toward a materialist view of the mind, which that can be interpreted in different ways, but it does suggest to me that 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 sort of atheism might be playing a role in the materialism. Because you might think it goes the other way, right? You have independent reasons for materialism and that plays a role leading towards atheism, except that there's more skepticism of the materialism um, than there is of the existence of God among the philosophers of mind. And I've talked with atheist philosophers of mind who have told me that you know they're convinced by these arguments from consciousness that there's their mind there's more to their mind than just that than just matter i mean i've even talked with philosophers who told me because they're convinced that mind isn't reducible to matter and they think matter is all there is that there is no mind um and that that just it suggests to me that these considerations in the philosophy of mind are actually a, a, playing a, a role in people's thinking but then also that people's larger worldview is also playing a role in their analysis of these arguments and data points. Sure. And that's how it always goes. Of course. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. You guys uh, wrapped up there on the mind. We finished that's the a, mind. <laughs> we've, we've, we've done. We finished the mind. Yeah. Scratch I mean, it's, the it's, it's Yeah. We <laughs> barely touched it. I mean, yeah, because the interesting question there is, um, the one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about there, and it might help clarifying where your guys' worldviews differ, is, I mean, there are there are people who are physicalists about the mind or even about, you know, persons or material beings. Like, uh, I, th I believe Peter Van Inwagen leans towards that. Or um, I think Joe and I, we talked about Hud Hudson before, just a second ago, and who was like that. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a live option, even if you're a physicalist about the mind, whether or not theism or naturalism is true. But the, the one thing I wanted to talk to you guys, uh, ask you guys about is, well, kind of I wanted to see where you guys think you stand at now in terms of, you know, what you disagree on now that you've had some time for clarification. But but it seems to me uh, the way kind of Joe phrased his initial question, the kind of deeper question there is what's called um, source physicalism or, or source idealism. And so if I'm not mistaken, that might be one source of disagreement because Graham's wanting to say minds are late and local. So any mental properties, mental things are going to eventually come about by a result of these physical processes. So our, our source is going to be physical. Um, whereas Josh, it, it's from what I've read of you, you're wanting to say the foundation is mental or has these mental, maybe just proto-phenomenal properties as mm -hmm. you and Leon talked about it. And so you, you say that the physical stuff is either part of or it comes from, but at, at the source we have mind. I mean, you may not say that's all we have, but at least there is that there. So do you guys think it's fair to say that maybe a disagreement between you two is just kind of this source idealism versus source physicalism mm -hmm. or do you guys have some common ground there as well or guys i mean maybe you neither of you would call your views that maybe you would like to choose some different terms but what, what do we think i think that i think that's right i think um the sort of fundamentality of mind versus matter seems to be a dividing line i think that's right that's well put you think yeah, so too I, I i agree too yeah okay because that, that's important when we're you know we're looking at mm -hmm you know, what you guys actually like differ because there's so much common ground in terms of inquiry, wanting to minimize these things and where the actual line is drawn. Mm -hmm. So that's one place to draw it is, um, is, you know, the natural physical distinction there. Mm -hmm. um, man, I got so many questions I wrote down in the process I want to ask you guys, but we're, we got time winding down here. But Joe, did you have any, your, your 
consciousness was your topic to ask about. So did you have anything out of that discussion you wanted to get any more clarification on? Um, I mean, I wanted to talk, touch on a little bit, but we probably don't have too much time. Just like the definition of matter or physical. Um, I mean, like, it seems to me that the best thing, we have the best epistemic access to the nature of minds. Um, I, I know Russell talked about, um, I mean, it goes into the philosophy of science and the epistemic structural realism, you know, like, do we truly have access to the nature of material things uh, and, and physical things? Um, like, what is a physical thing? Like, what is a material thing? Uh, it seems as though we can only come to them via our first personal, um, you know, conscious properties. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you guys could touch on that, how that bears on this debate, perhaps? Um, I love those questions, and uh, I have those questions, too. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry not to be more helpful here i mean you know we've had email discussion about this very thing um those are good questions so i'm a bit skeptical uh i think that the things that we know best are actually the kind of medium sized dry goods in our environment that kind of thing uh and you only have to look at the behavior of other people and animals to realize actually how poorly we understand the mind by comparison. Um, that's um, so, so I would start from somewhere quite different. I also think that um, there isn't, I mean, I'm not one of those people who's very fond of the idea that there's a problem of other minds and that somehow or other you know that you've got a mind and yet you don't <laughs> there's this question about everybody else and animals about whether they've got them as well right so so there's a there there is a bunch of consi all i'll say here is there's a bunch of considerations on the other side about what we know best mm -hmm. i think if, if i could just add not in a disagreement but just to add that um i would sort of think of inference to belief in other minds as a kind of best explanation of my own inner experience uh, that comes to me through my interactions with other people. I know that opens up a whole nother mm, yeah. set of things about how you can make that argument. Um, but just to tell a little anecdote, which I think kind of summarizes sort of how I kind of resonate with Joe's way of putting those questions is when I met my wife, Rachel, she wasn't my wife at the time, but I met her and I got very excited and we started hanging out and I got maybe overly excited and I had this thought. I just remember having this thought like this person is just made perfect for me. And I'm not saying like made by God. I just mean like this is just the one I'm going to marry or she's a holographic image designed by aliens. <laughs> they tricked me. Okay. And it was like I was entering <laughs> hypothesis, you know, as a possibility, you know, even though I didn't think it was probable at all. Um, but by comparison, I knew my own feelings about her. And that wasn't a matter of probabilistic inference or speculation in the slightest. And I think this is actually consistent with what Graham is saying about understanding the mind and all the sort of philosophical questions that could be asked about the mind. But I think there are some things that you can see so clearly just from first person experience so hmm. yeah just to say i mean it's good to know uh you know with these discussions josh multitask is yeah uh, multitasks he gets brownie points and makes interesting points <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's good there um okay so yeah it seems like we have some common ground there if not i mean you guys did seem to kind of have a synthesis with the mind even though as graham said he's skeptical of there being genuine agreement it seems like there's sort of a kind of a an almost common ground on like the monist point like kind of the closure we're just wanting to simplify is you guys both want to get there so if we get and nothing the else value out of, the of mind, scientific data yeah the value of the empirical data is helping us and not just going in your little corner and trying to a priori figure it all out, uh, despite my joy in doing that sort of thing. <laughs> the philosopher's armchair, you know. Yeah. 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 Okay. So one 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 of our last points on the the numbered chart here that um, Josh, I know you said you'd kind of resonated with Graham's point in the video I had with him, and I'm trying to remember how to phrase it. 
Um, but just like the, the point he made about comparing total worldviews instead of parts of worldviews. And mm -hmm. I know you guys touched on this before, um, <clears throat> but it, it kind of came up a little bit with Joe's question about the Trinity, too. Like, you know, when we're comparing, I, I think the way Graham phrased it was in our earlier video was something along the lines of like, you know, not comparing naturalism to like maybe just this basic like theism. But like, you know, we're comparing sort of in a lot of cases, we're comparing naturalism to some form of like Christian theism. Um, so there's going to have that's going to entail things like trinitarianism angels demons so I, i'm actually not sure uh, how I, i'm undecided on how important this distinction is i mean do you guys comparing total worldviews i mean it seems like when we're talking about sources we don't have to do that but when we're comparing big pictures because there's obviously a quantitative point about big pictures but is it really relevant enough to warrant you know talking about the quality what do you guys think there about, about the, the use, the, maybe the, so, the virtues of comparing total worldviews. So, I mean, I guess one thing is, uh, on its own, finding some little point on which one worldview seems to have an advantage over the other, all else being equal, mm -hmm. is generally going to turn out not to be very interesting, right? Because uh, the kind of question you really want to know is, so which is the better worldview? Mm -hmm. And you will always be able to pick any pair of worldviews mm -hmm. if you're careful enough in what you select and what considerations you take into account you'll be able to find that one the one view is better than the other in that respect with respect to that data right um and i just think that we shouldn't care very much about that mm -hmm. right i mean we shouldn't be interested in pursuing that this this um what one of the ways that this I think comes sort of uh, ramifies out is that you get lots of arguments uh, in philosophy of religion which are a sort of um, here's a little point where my mm. side's doing better than the other and I'm quite entitled to think that everything else is equal so I can conclude that I've you know from mm. this that this is a very important point <laughs> in the case for my view whereas I think that kind of way of approaching things is just kind of misguided. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I, I resonate a lot with that. Um, this is actually helpful hearing you kind of unpack that a little bit because I was wondering, in, in your conversation with Micah, you expressed a kind of frustration when people do that. <laughs> and I was kind of wondering, yeah. you know, what's the roots, what are the roots of that frustration? And and I was kind of wondering if it, it could even be in the sort of dialectical contest where one side is sort of seeking to win against the other. And so what they do is they pick one thing and they find, oh, I have an advantage here. Everything else is equal. I win. Right. Unless you can show that not everything else is equal. Well, of course, not everything else is equal. And you haven't even put your whole worldview on the table, which includes all sorts of things that I think have disadvantages. Um, and so that's helpful. And I, I think if the if the frame of inquiry changes so that it's not about a dialectal contest, it's just about putting our lights together. I find it very helpful to focus on one property at a time, just so we can get clarity on that one thing. You know, that's why I was so curious to talk more about simplicity and see, okay, which you know, is there a simplicity advantage? What is it? How do we characterize it? If we can get clear on that, then let's go to predictive success. Let's go to this not in a dialectical contest, but just to get clear about one thing at a time, because if I give you my whole worldview, then I've got to list, you know, my four kids and my wife and, you know, like so many <laughs> things that will distract us. And, and even philosophical things about um, the nature of numbers and propositions and uh, all sorts so, of things. So, so I guess that's partly true, but partly not, because we we kind of know already that there's lots of stuff we just agree about. Right. I might not know that you've got four kids, you sure. might not know that I've got three, sure. right? But but, but that's not going to impact one way or another on the kind of, of discussions that we're really interested in pursuing. And in fact, most of common sense and most of science just won't impact because while one of us may know some of it that the other one doesn't, we would just agree were we, you mm. know, appropriately presented with enough information about those things we would just agree about them and so we can narrow down what we're looking at a bit but it still leaves an absolutely enormous amount that's the 
there's so much that isn't brought in just by the, you know, agreement on how many children mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. all the rest well, of Well, may, maybe yeah. we've made some progress in this conversation to bring a lot more in, I hope. I mean, we talked about a list of questions that look like we couldn't even cover them all. But it looks <laughs> well, like we, we haven't almost... finished yet. There's oh, one okay. left. There's still one left. Well, there's at least one left. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, we yeah. kind of... Uh... A couple of them, like, were subsumed into the others, and I added some, like, as we were going. So, I mean, we we really covered all of, like, the main overarching points. Um, I mean, the kind of a lot of them. But, but you guys jumped around order on us. We went to point six after, like, point one. So, <laughs> but it was great. The way it Natural. flowed, I think, was about perfect. Yeah, no, it was, it felt, it was flowed very naturally. So, I mean, yeah, we covered all the all the major points. So, I guess um, I know we got to be, we're kind of, closing in on two hours here so be respectful of your guys time but um if it's all right with you guys i think it'd be good to maybe sort of wrap it up things how we started we started with talking about agreeing about methods of inquiry simplicity you know, theoretical predictive success things like that and so i wonder at this point um i hope i, I guess that i want to i want to see if, if we've made progress or what progress we made exactly so i hope josh you've got a little more clarity on where the distinction actually is between um, your view in grams and maybe even your view in naturalism. I mean, if you've, you've probably figured out, at least you had a little more clarity on whether or not you're a naturalist. So I guess uh, if you guys are okay with this, we can just kind of finish off by saying um, sort of where we've cleared some things up or maybe haven't. We need to, um, mm -hmm. so hopefully we got some clarity at least. Yeah, no, that, that actually before our conversation, I wrote down some points of progress that I predicted we would have. Uh, and I, I wrote down clarifying what's at stake, clarifying terms, uh, clarifying some of the implications of different views, and then showing how philosophers who disagree about things can use some common tools to make progress. I mean, those are general points. Um, I found it really helpful to get a little more specific on the term natural and to see how that can play a role um, in our thinking about arbitrary limits and making that connection. Um, I found that to be quite valuable and helpful. Um, I thought it was also helpful to get a little bit clear on the sort of the meaning of identity uh, and think about whether that's type or token. Um, so, I mean, there were other things we helped to clarify as well, but those are just a few that stand out. Yeah. So I'll say I've been, I've got another project that's going on that's made me think a lot about the simplicity question and the more i think about it the harder it seems which is the way that philosophy <laughs> always is uh, it's progress but it's progress that goes sort of one step forwards and then 10 backwards i think a lot of the time unfortunately but yeah but um yeah uh i've there's plenty to take away and think about i'd like to think more about the no arbitrary limits Point. I'm not sure about all the kind of raft of considerations that apply there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's, I think, a really interesting thing to pursue further. Mm -hmm. Well, Graham, maybe we can write a paper on simplicity. We can join forces. That yeah, would well, awesome. that, that, would, that, that would be interesting, I think. <laughs> to do that. that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, you guys should. I mean, I'm a little bit of a biased party, obviously, because I'm a fan, but you guys should definitely do that. <laughs> definitely. I know Joe and I would read it and talk about it, so it'd be great. Um, but I mean, I, I just say I got a lot out of this, a lot of clarity and actually seeing you guys disagree because um, it's helpful for me. Because, you know, I, I've read both of you. And so kind of reading Graham's work on naturalism, I kind of also did take it as a given, like I sort of took the terms naturally primitive and like the simplicity thing to be pretty much decided. And so having Josh's, all his clever pushback on that and thinking about it more than getting you guys to talk about it, it's been great for me. And actually, again, kind of thinking about the simplicity point more. So um, I, I helped clarify some stuff. I'm glad you guys did too. And I got a lot out of it. So I guess let's finish up with saying uh, I didn't do this earlier. I apologize for that. But thank you guys both so much for being here, for coming on. Uh, we had to work out some time zones, but it was definitely worth it. And uh, I really appreciate both of you taking time out of your busy days and schedules to come, you know, sit and talk to us about all this, all this stuff, uh, arbitrary or not, <laughs> for what, two hours now. So I just really appreciate both your time, Graham braving a cold and 
hundred degree weather up there and everything. <laughs> yeah, I also so, want to um, thank you. So I really appreciate your time. It's just wonderful getting to speak with you guys. So it's real. Yeah, it was a pleasure. It really was. Yeah, it was thank great you. having you guys. And Joe, thank you for having you back on as well. So uh, yeah, until next time, let's stop the recording here.